PFM, the Public Finance Management. And then we have Jimmy. Jimmy is right below uh, Mark. Jimmy is based in Singapore. And uh, he's our uh, leader in Singapore uh, for responsible for all the blockchain related activities. Okay, and and uh, and and Sean is sitting here. He's also based in Taiwan. He's on my team. Um, he he's in in my uh, finance team. Mm -hmm. And Didi um, is uh, the left right hand. Right. Didi is based in in uh, Japan. And he's also currently uh, working on the public finance management okay. and uh, blockchain uh, initiative. So we, we got him on the team. And to the right side, um, Devon or Devon? How, how do you pronounce your name? Yeah, it's Devon. Devon, Devon, okay. So Devon is based in, in New York. Uh, she is our uh, technical lead. Uh, for, for the PFM blockchain, um, so we, we call it product, but mm -hmm. yeah, the initiative. And and the left, uh, right down, Prama, the one with the big beard. <laughs> <laughs> he is also based in, in, the, in Canada. He's our uh, product manager for the public uh, finance management. So that, that's quickly... Uh, mm -hmm. We've got the slides here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I think our key objective is uh, to have you know, Mark and, and also from Jimmy, from our team to, to discuss and share uh, why we're doing this, why mm -hmm. we believe in, in the transparency. Mm -hmm. And uh, they first came to me and, and you know, <laughs> because of your uh, podcast, I said, mm -hmm. wow, Taiwan must really care about transparency. And then okay. I am also very passionate about this subject. Okay. So that, that's why we initiated uh, the podcast this. I appear in. Yes. Yeah. Because my podcast is yet to be launched. It's <laughs> roughly a month or so from now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll be lo looking forward to that. Okay. And, and then we will share a little bit about uh, our experience and our approach uh, using this technology uh, to, to solve this problem. And then lastly, we want to get you some of your input and also advice for us and how to uh, maybe help Taiwan uh, government to, to create this uh, transparency mm -hmm. you, you, using the blockchain technology. Okay, speaking of transparency, uh, uh, our side of the meeting uh, is going to be recorded. Uh, there's a video cam roughly from this angle, yeah. uh, which probably doesn't capture your faces. Uh, <laughs> like it's, it's not like your likeness will be captured, but the, the audio will. Uh, and then we will publish it under Creative Commons attribution uh, to, well, at least YouTube, but maybe to some future blockchain. Uh, okay, so um, we're really, really happy uh, to be meeting uh, ey.com uh, yeah. from yeah. ey.gov uh, yeah. office because we're in the executive UN uh, and my email address is literally ey.gov.tw. Um, and so um, looking forward to the, to the sharing. Yeah, so EY with the EY. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. Yeah, dot .com and dot, dot .gov. That's exactly right. Okay, so so with that, I think uh, I'll, I'll pass this on to, um, I think uh, Jimmy will, will, will go right. first. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, John. Thanks again, Audrey, for taking the time for this. Um, and, you know, in the interest of time, I think let me just jump straight into the presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I just like to set a stage about what we do as a firm or blockchain uh, and uh, you know, one important aspect about blockchain is that it is always something about ecosystem um, and in EY we believe in that as well because uh, even the way that we set up the blockchain team uh, is a global organization that cuts across uh, all the service lines. We have four service lines covering assurance, consulting, tech and legal and strategy uh, and our blockchain covers all the all these areas uh, other than consulting on the assurance attestation portion as well so and our vision you know since uh, the inception of this team has always been that blockchain will do for a business ecosystem uh, or a network of enterprises or government agencies what an erp system did for a single company and and it is quite a dense uh, statement but i feel that you know the more i've gone through this Statement, the more I've gone through blockchain POCs and projects with company, the more true I how it, be, it becomes, right? Because what the ERP did for a single company, maybe 20, 30 years ago, is it standardizes the processes within a company. Order to cash, procure to pay. Uh, it standardizes the data that's used to process this set of processes. So you have master data, 
like vendors, uh, GLs, material. But what it cannot do, an ERP, is to cut across multiple enterprises. For that, usually a lot of interfaces and what is known as uh, electronic data exchange, EDIs, takes place. And you, you will see a mass web of uh, various exchanges, which uh, largely would be inconsistent and takes a long time to build up. Uh, which we feel that the coming of blockchain is to allow these networks of companies or government agencies to be able to interact and do what previously an ERP company, mm -hmm. uh, an ERP system did for a mm -hmm. single company. So maybe and we so call we it ecosystem resource planning uh, or something. So long. Sorry. Uh, Audrey, sorry, you had a question, is it? No, so, so maybe we can call this new, new ERP ecosystem resource planning or something. But please go ahead. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're, you're right. I mean, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's many people who say that perhaps you will take over the ERP system in the company. Uh, we feel that perhaps not so at the moment, right? Because the ERP for a company is still for a certain purpose. Uh, it's internal processes, right? But you're right in terms of the network of companies that need to be integrated. Uh, blockchain provides a very, very good platform for that. Uh, and we have done quite a fair bit of work over the years, right? So if you look at the third point on the right, a lot of our R&D has gone into blockchain design, uh, especially around ZKB, Zero Knowledge Proof. So it's a protocol that we have developed quite a fair bit on and open source quite a fair bit on as well. Uh, we developed some of these protocols on public Ethereum with Microsoft as well. We launched Baseline, which is a, a protocol between uh, EY, Consensus, and Microsoft. So that again, we open source for the public to use. All uh, towards, all in the, the, the effort towards enabling our vision, right? That blockchain will be able to do for uh, business networks what ERP did for us in our company. So Didi, if you can go to the next slide. Um, you know, as part of our product strategy, as part of going towards that vision as well, we have two major platforms that we built on. Uh, the first is on OpsChain. So EY OpsChain is a platform that allows enterprises to transact with each other on both public and private blockchains. And there's, there's many different applications we built on OpsChain. Uh, the one we will focus on today, uh, and my colleagues will take it on later on in a lot more detail, is the public finance manager. So that's one thing that I think uh, has served uh, large public institutions very well in enabling transparency of finances and enabling traceability of where budget goes to. Uh, the other product that is uh, that we are focusing on is more from a assurance angle, right? That we help people who want to analyze what's on the blockchain uh, be able to do so with a tool we call Blockchain Analyzer. So that platform works uh, you know, hand in glove with OpsChain. Uh, it, it works hand in glove with most of the major public and private pla blockchain platforms as well. So, uh, Didi, if we go to the next slide, please. I think, uh, you know, I just wanted to just showcase uh, a few examples of ecosystems that we have helped connect uh, And the next slides uh, will show that uh, it, across food and beverage traceability, across uh, medical supply chain, across shipping and logistics, uh, and of course, around, uh, across fund management, you know, managing of fund management, which is the focus of today's discussion, uh, we have used this platform to gain uh, users to allow users uh, in different parts of different organizations be able to connect with each other as well. So um, that's all I have in terms of making sure that uh, you know perhaps setting a stage of, of where we are at in terms of uh, EY blockchain. Uh, I think that what the next uh, section we are covering is Mark is going to go through very specifically one of the application on ops chain, which is called what we call PF and public finance manager. Uh, and that's an area I think uh, has interest, not just very large government institutions, uh, but also international institutions as well that disperse a lot of funds and one desire a means of to have transparency around this fund and to have traceability around this fund. So uh, Mark, perhaps I pass the time to you now to go through a little bit on PFM and overview of PFM. Well, very happy to do so. And uh, Minister, good evening. Good morning for you, but uh, good evening very happily from, from here, just, just outside of Toronto. Um, let me just pick up on a couple of themes, but I also want to just tell you a little bit about the story and the legacy of why it is that we have, that we have built what we have built. Um, and uh, with the team here and with many others along our side uh, are now well and truly into 
uh, the application and we think with some very exciting results. Uh, and we'll give you some kind of technical details. So Devin and Promote in particular have, have, have worked on building some things up and you'll see one of, one of the applications that we've been doing. Um, and I can tell you this, uh, working with, uh, with, with some of the largest global or organizations, the international financial in institutes like the World Bank, uh, the United Nations, the IMF, and so on. Um, but let me just step, step back, and, and, and Jimmy picked up on a couple of very important points. He, he, he used words like ecosystem, he used words like value, uh, he did mention budget, and for me, as the global leader of our public financial management space, including the blockchain space, but more broadly than that, it really is centered around the notion of the public budget, uh, and as you will no doubt experience in your day-to-day -day life, but we across the world, almost every jurisdiction that we work in, um, at the heart of all things government, of course, are all things public budget. Uh, and the reason for that, as, and I don't need to give you this lesson, but it's, but it's important to ground the, the mechanisms here. The reason is that it's not just about the money but it is in fact about what the intention of that money is. Uh, and it is the marriage of financial resource with social outcome, with public safety, with transparency, with democracy. That actually is the combination of what makes public financial management so important. Uh, and so when we view innovation uh, in the field of public budgeting, um, we, yes, are involved with an awful lot of work around planning, around budgeting systems, and so forth. But one of the things that we have the, um, I'm going to say the privilege, but also I suppose the expectation from our, from our various partners around the world, uh, is that we should always be looking for that next level of advancement. And in this particular case, the next level of advancement in public budgeting has found itself to involve the creation of the blockchain solution that uh, we're happy to share with you here today. And the reason for that comes back to this notion that from a democratic perspective, from an accountability perspective, from an output, from an outcome perspective, I want to understand the efficiency, the effectiveness, the productivity of the way that my public budgets are being allocated the way that they are being consumed, and the results that they are driving. And what that means is that across an increasingly complex ecosystem that can start with central agencies, central budget authorities, the various forms of line department, operating agencies, and so on, and increasingly a whole range of external actors, both near and far from, from, from government structures properly, the ecosystem that is actually executing the intentions of public budget are very complicated, very complex. And from a data management perspective, from an information management perspective, connecting the complexity is a technological challenge. It is obviously a governance and a business challenge as, as, as well. But blockchain, for all of the reasons that Jimmy described, and I think for all of the reasons that you personally un understand, the marriage between the intention and the execution of a public budget frame, a public financial management frame, enabled by this exciting and, and, and now well-emerged and well-proven te technology, is really the value that is being driven. Uh, and the value that we're seeing is essentially as, as follows. And Didi, if we get to the next page, please. There's a really simple phrase that the intention is to enhance transparency, uh, to provide single sources of truth and so forth across the entire range and the complexity of the way that public budgets are set, defined and executed, uh, to improve allocated efficiency, which is essentially around the economic and the social value, uh, and to provide a single source of truth to improve the administrative. Oops. Uh, Mark, we cannot Mark. hear you. Can you pause? <sighs> Can you hear? 
No, I think it's it's our slides problem. It's it's the portable uh, speaker. It's the portable uh, yeah. speaker. Yeah, it's we're, our we're speaker good. here. We're, we're good. good now. That's okay. Actually, uh, you sounded better with the other speakers. <laughs> <laughs> there you right. go. I, so, I'll, I'll pick up the telephone if you want. That's right. So uh, we're, we're, we're right, right around the source of truth. Put yeah. the public budget at the heart, uh -huh. and then you've got the revenue functions of government, you've got the expenditure and the regulatory functions of government, and every one of the, of the issues that you're trying to drive involves some degree of improved transparency, single sources of truth, and the efficiency of that, but most importantly, the effectiveness. Uh, and, on, and on the final slide that I'll speak to, you can actually see essentially, which is, which is the next one, please, there, Didi. We'll get, we'll get to the very, the very um, powerful, parsimonious, which is simple, but it, but it really is the simplicity married with the technological capability that drives the capability, the capacity enhancement that we're seeing around the world now, which is essentially, I now in real time integrated across the complexity of the ecosystem and able to understand what my public budget is being spent on, which is essentially the statutory reporting, the public accounts view, how and when it's being spent by the variety of actors that are involved, which is really an efficiency and a productivity, a value for money, uh, sort of frame, which again, I think most elected and certainly the senior non-elected officials that we work with are very interested in. And what I would say to you most importantly of all is the connection then to the outcomes, the outputs delivered and the outcomes achieved, which kind of full circles the intention of public budget. I have public money, I have an intention, I deliver a result, and for the decision makers and the influencers that we work with, we want to be able to provide a real time, very, very near, near to real time, efficient access to that integrated in information. And our PFM blockchain solution provides our capability to do that. So let's take you just a little bit. I might pause and just ask you if there are any questions, if that seems to make some, some sense for you, and if it does, then what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll ask Devin to just tell you just a little bit about some of the technological application, the way that it's been built and applied in particular. I think we're going to use one of the World Bank examples to kind of speak speak to and frame. But any, any questions at this stage, Minister? Um, I, I do have quite a few questions, but it's about the, the Nightfall data, uh, data-based um, code base and the pull requests and the security vulnerabilities and various other technical aspects being a software engineer by training. Uh, but on the on the top level strategy, no, this is very clear. I don't have much questions. All right, fantastic. Well, I'll tell you what, let's take you down a level or two into some of the technological full detail and you've got the right people on the uh, on the call to be able to answer some of those deep detailed questions Thank you. for sure. Devin, that will over, over to you. Perfect, thank you. Um, so we'll be, as Mark mentioned, taking a look at some client use cases. So um, we'll be looking at, in particular, uh, the World Bank Group. And the goal here was to track funds for the purpose of um, making sure that developing countries received vaccinations. And we'll be looking at another use case, which involves funding local food ecosystems, um, again, for, for countries in need who, um, who need to have food sources and that really starting capital um, in order to have seeds, the livestock, um, as well as the farming equipment in place in order to start their own ecosystem. So we'll be, we'll be talking about those two use cases um, in more detail. But the graph that you see here um, really shows the flow of funds down from what we call the L0, so our donors, down into our government entities, and then to our borrowers at our uh, level three suppliers and providers, and then down to the beneficiaries. Um, and again, this is in some ways an over oversimplification of the real process. So in many cases, you might have multiple providers and suppliers 
Um, instead of just one, you might have multiple borrowers, and you might have funds that flow uh, directly from government agencies all the way down to beneficiaries or directly to the suppliers. Um, and again, we'll get into the more um, the technicalities of PFM in just a little bit. But um, again, walking through on the far left, so we have our donors um, and the examples that I mentioned. Um, this could be, in some cases, the EU. And um, the donors want to make sure that their funds are being spent appropriately. So in most cases, um, they're able to see this view with uh, an audit that occurs a year or two later after the project is complete. Um, and with PFM, we really are, uh, we, our goal is to give a more real-time uh, view into the objectives of these projects and link those objectives back to the funds that are being sent down from donors, again, through this, through this fund flow. Um, so if you'll go to the next slide. So I'd love to talk about the um, process that we walk through uh, for the PFM solution. So we have typically uh, our, our donors donate funds. Um, they have agreements with various entities. So in this case, there's an agreement with the donor and with the receiver of funds, so our government entities. And many times these are tied to project objectives that are then passed down to the borrowers. So um, we have agreements, you know, between one and three, three and five, and then in some cases five and seven. Um, and we're going to talk about how these agreements link back to the blockchain. So if you'll go to the next slide. Perfect. So um, we don't need to do a deep dive into all the capabilities of smart contracts, but um, for the agreements between our donors and our borrower, and sorry, our donors and our government entities, we have smart contracts where we can define um, who the parties are, what requirements have to be met uh, before funds can be released. So for example, who needs to sign off on these funds? Um, are there any objectives that need to be met before those funds um, are released, et cetera? So we have agreements between our donor entities, our government entities, as well as our government entities and our borrowers. So in this case, this could again be, be linked to objectives um, and, and these smart contracts are fairly flexible. So they also handle the invoices um, as well as the base tokenization for physical assets, um, such as farming equipment or bags of seed. Um, and so on and so forth. So any questions there? Mm -hmm. Yep, it, it's really clear, thank you. Perfect, um, so I'll pass it on to Pramod. And if you'll go to the next slide, great. All right, thanks, Devin. Uh, following up on uh, you know, Mark's overview on PFM and also Devin's example of what we've done with uh, the World Bank and the aid and development financing world in general. Uh, I'll provide a quick uh, view under the hood in the product architecture uh, and how we built the EY option PM solution. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, so starting at the very top, uh, the end users can be departments and agencies of the federal government, provincial, regional, or city and municipal governments. End users can also be international financial institutions or multilateral development agencies such as uh, the ones that I mentioned. Now, as you move down, what you see is the financial management pillars and how transparency can be applied in any of these fundamental pillars, such as the revenue that's flowing into the government, expenditure that's going out of the government, regulatory compliance aspects, or their delivery services. Now, if you keep moving down, this can be applied now in these domains. Now, it can be applied to multiple use cases. While this is not a comprehensive uh, list of client applications that you see, examples could be grants and loans management, transfer payments between different levels of government, shared services and cost allocation, and long-term capital projects and asset utilization uh, initiatives, etc. Now, if you see the yellow box there, those are the core capabilities that we've built in solution that support these use cases. And they're organized as microservices and they're available via, via API uh, through a service layer. And for the you'll also see the core blockchain components underneath, they're the ones that underpin these services. 
uh, which is the smart contract model, the token model, so ERC20s for funds, for example, ERC some months for assets. Um, you also have ERC1155 now for multi tokens to represent multiple tokens within lending agreements, loans, grants, etc. And also, if you see the identity access management through user authentication organization management, which is we manage the permissions down to the granular level within the smart contract. So every transaction needs to be authorized before they're made. So we have granular permission control. Um, and of course, finally, we have the infrastructure layer. Uh, and to note here is that we are currently built on the private Ethereum protocol. The plans are underway right now to incorporate uh, zero knowledge proof into a smart contract model to make it compatible with public Ethereum network, but that's something that's coming in the future. But mainly, the architecture you see here it's, it drives a product design and it is designed in a way to flexible enough for us to configure for multiple use cases across the various PFM pillars and also across multiple levels of the value chain. So, uh, Didi, if we can move to the next one. Uh, Didi, I, my, my suggestion is I, I think we should probably take some of uh, Audrey's uh, technical questions and, and have a bit of interaction here. Yeah, uh, it's fine. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I saw the suggestion that maybe uh, I should share some use cases uh, yeah. and I'm happy to, to do that as well. This is like fully transparent chat. I love that. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. Yeah, I was thinking, you know, that uh, the example that Devon shared uh, is for the World Bank. Uh, so if you can go back a couple of slices, slice the uh, and, but if you expand uh, across, uh, you know, the ecosystems that we talked about, so I think it can be applied across many, many uh, ministries of institution as well. So I was just wondering, do you see uh, any potential areas within Taiwan that you feel that, you know, such a landscape is, uh, is, is uh, useful as well or possible as well? Well, the, the top level question is that um, since this looks like a Zcash-ish uh, overlay on top of the main Ethereum chain, uh, and it looks like um, it, it's public domain, right? Uh, so it, it looks like one can just take it and run, uh, like literally taking it and run copyright wise. Um, and, and so what, what's, what's preventing your ecosystem partners to simply build um, a, a bridge to the main main line, but run uh, mostly as a private uh, blockchain uh, due to um, cybersecurity concerns that I do not personally share. Uh, but but what what's your your angle uh, in convincing people to run this entirely on the on the main line um, and with the double risk of the main line going somewhere else uh, as well as uh, your um, timber system uh, not actually being able to to re, um, to recover uh, uh, the, the state from the full history from the main line. It looks like a, a extra burden as compared to private solutions. Um, I think uh, spot on, uh, Minister, I think you've got a good point because uh, part of this solution, in fact, in the earlier days uh, when the public solution is not that mature, that was just maybe three to five years ago. Uh, a lot of companies do this as part of a private chain. So they take Ethereum, it goes into a private version of Ethereum mm -hmm. or Uh And that's, that's uh, even to, to till today, I think uh, a lot of uh, agencies are still, uh, you know, going on the on this path. Largely also because they are not comfortable with maybe on, or, or lack of some understanding of what's available on the public blockchain and, you know, whether the scalability issue and the security issue is there. Uh, so, which is why, uh, you know, I mentioned a little bit about ZKP just now. So, ZKP is just one of the aspects uh, amongst a few other things in the solution that allows the public blockchain to work. So, what we have put on ZKP is to allow a transaction on the public blockchain between two parties to be private, right? So, you know that a transaction occurs, you know, and it's able to validate the transaction. Uh, but you do not need to understand what is the content behind the transaction. And mm -hmm. we understand that also there's a need for that because a lot of enterprises, when they transact on the public blockchain, they still want their contracts to be 
to be confidential between the two parties. So that's the purpose of the CKP. Now for the purpose of PFM, uh, I think the maybe different uh, agencies will have different agenda. Uh, some, you know, uh, for the purpose of traceability and transparency, may feel that it's okay uh, for you know the, where the sources of funds to be used or when they want to be used uh, to be made known. Uh, some just maybe want it to be restricted within that certain ecosystem. So, which is why I think I believe that uh, you know some of the solutions will still be on private blockchain mm-hmm. uh, even today. Yeah. So, um, uh, because on, yeah, I, I'm I'm more referring to a. It really, it's not technical. It's it's a social um, pressure, a social issue. That is to say, if I'm a say level two uh, implementing agency uh, and I made a, a mistake, uh, maybe I um, made a mistake in a recording of a number in a, a few that's off by a few orders of magnitude. Um, and then uh, using a, a private net, uh, I can use cybersecurity as excuse uh, to talk to just my uh, three L3s uh, and one L1, uh, and then we pretend this never happened. Uh, but, but if I'm implementing the PFM as dictated by L1 to publish that particular field, um, there really is no way uh, to not make the correction publicly, um, according to what I understand of your design. Uh, and, and so I, I'm just wondering what, what what's your standard response to that social pressure? Uh, because they're entirely not committing illegal things if they convince their 303s and 1L1 to make that mistake, um, you know, gone from the books. Uh, but with your design, it's, n- it's now not um, possible to hide it from the public. Yeah, I think I might I might take just a little bit of that if, if, sure. if, if I can these ministers. So, I mean, let me just step back. We've we've been very, very careful, uh, and both in the structural design that underpins this, but I think also in all of our kind of like you just called it sort of governance design type type questions to 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 build to build a solution that is flexible to the purpose that it is intended to be to be applied for in the vision of whichever state or sub-state act- actor that it is that we're working for. And we have the capability for that to be fully publicly transparent, but it doesn't have to be. Okay. Just as today's exchange systems are not, in fact, hardly at all, pu- truly publicly uh, o- o- open and transparent, so too can this, can this be built. So we have been very careful to make sure that those sorts of issues of governance and who has access to what we call it the delegation of authority i think you probably understand that right at law the appropriation structure also includes various delegations of authority who has access to what bits of information when what what type and so on if there are honest errors that are made well those i think are just honest errors and they can be corrected but if you and it's not Yes, we are doing work that, that, that involves the integrity of the exchange, um, corruption and so forth. We are, we are dealing with, with some of those uh, perspectives. But let's just frame it in terms of if there's an error, it can be corrected. Not everybody needs to see the fact that there was because it's most likely that it is being a- applied in the same sort of delegation of authority and access frame as would be today's uh, uh, financial systems. The the enhancements, though, are that I'm starting to connect not just financial tracking, but I'm connecting the financial tokens to the non-financial expectations. As Pramod said, we're able to connect operating with capital, we're able to tie to hard assets, to social assets, and so on. And what we're getting is that we are getting the integrity, the complexity, and so forth into an integrated view. We can still define through governance who has access to that view. Uh, and ultimately, maybe that might be fully public and transparent, but it doesn't have to be. Okay, so no. what, yeah, okay. Yeah, my, my uh, main question is just it allows the ones on the upstream, the L1, for example, to apply extra um, enforced by algorithm, not by law, um, constraints on, say, their downstreams, the L2 and so on, using this design 
uh, that L2 are in a relatively powerless um, situation as compared to private blockchains uh, or other backend systems uh, to to um, argue back, basically. It, it's just an observation. But I understand your point that if you have yeah. the um, collaborative incentive for all the uh, neighboring layers, then of course you can change um, exactly how near real time, how near is that near real time and so on. Uh, I understand that part, yeah. So, so one of the one of the things, and, and I just I know we just pick up one of the one of the comments that you've just made there is it I mean it really goes to the incentive structure that is also mm-hmm. tied tied to this because you can take a very kind of centralized view from the central budget authority down, and I've got a high degree of authority and control that I'm trying to enforce. But again, it doesn't have to be like mm-hmm. that. I don't know of any system in the world, Canada, Taiwan, the United States, it doesn't matter. We always have the authority of things like audit reporting and so on, but we don't necessarily want to introduce that sort of heavy-handed approach. Mm-hmm. What we actually want to do is we want to allow for the administrative efficiency of those reconciliations to mm-hmm. be as to be the efficiency to be as high as possible, the cost to be as low as possible, so that in fact we're not focusing our time and effort on the reporting, the financial reporting particularly across these organizational boundaries, but rather what we're collectively focused on is translating the money into the effort as effectively as possible and into the output and the outcome as effectively as possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what we're finding is that you're replacing the administrative effort and time spent doing things like reconciling and connecting systems and so on almost manually like we have to do to... to, um, Today, we're replacing that effort with focus on the more important issues of how do we actually improve service delivery systems, how do we go to enhance the economy of resource allocation, and so on. And so the incentive, we think anyway, we think that the incentive is a very positive one because both the funder, the fund manager, and the ultimate beneficiary have all got a shared interest and trying to make that uh, effectiveness, productivity, and value gain. Mm-hmm. Right, so the, the main idea is that it saves time on, on day one and hopefully reduce risk as well. That's exactly right. Uh-huh. Over time. Over, over, Amortized, over time. reduce yeah. risk, uh, but yeah. saves time on day one. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Okay, that, that's very clear. Uh, thank you. Um, and I have a, a couple of technical questions. Um, in, in the EY blockchain GitHub repository, um, the latest development has been around fixing security vulnerabilities and so on. Uh, but um, the governance system isn't quite clear because, for example, um, GitHub automatically uh, you know, send out dependency warnings when it comes to potential security vulnerabilities. The standard thing for a free software community to do is to triage and either close them as irrelevant or to merge them in. And there's also, you know, incoming issues that ask for clarity uh, on deployment and things like that. But it, it doesn't, um, with all due respect, it doesn't look like it's being real-time governed. Uh, and so um, is it actually the governance uh, goes somewhere else and GitHub is just a mirror uh, or, or what's going on uh, in the governance space for the open source project? Yeah, I can answer that one. Um, so uh, in an ideal world, if it's an open source project, you have uh, contributors from all over the world mm-hmm. who are, um, in this case, Dependabot actually opens up those uh, automatic pull requests for you. So it does all of the uh, all of the hard work and then you just have to pull down and test to make sure those updates uh, are mm-hmm. correctly applied and most times it's just version updates. Mm-hmm. Um, so in an ideal world, um, everyone from around the world would start to pull down and double check to make sure that that code was properly updated. Um, in this case, we do we do find that in the most in most cases, it's actually uh, EY employees who are who are double checking a lot of those pull requests. Uh, we do have outside contributors, um, but in, in most cases, we actually have uh, outside users, but not as many contributors to the code base. So um, that that's part of the reason why. But I do know we have a few uh, Dependabot suggestions in the in the PR backlog right now. Okay, so what, what I'm hearing and just checking my understanding um, is that the pilot cases you outlined 
uh, basically, um, you publish the, the API, the microservices and whatnot, uh, but then uh, people operate on the application layer above that. They don't actually have a lot of customization uh, requirements, not even um, you know the, the usual one about porting to a different uh, runtime environment or whatever. Uh, and and they uh, maybe they maintain some local deployment scripts and so on, but uh, the um, it's not a two way street. Like you're you're not actively um, coaching them uh, into the development team. We are we are coaching them in terms of uh, teaching them, but uh, yes, many times the uh, coders who are more profi- or at least proficient enough to understand and to use um, the Nightfall and other open source code bases that EY produces. Um, typically do uh, hard what we call hard forks, so mm-hmm. where they take uh, a copy of Nightfall and and, mm-hmm. and transform it, but uh, without necessarily contributing. Yeah, I, to I the know, I know, and, and and that's directly yeah. <laughs> due to your license choice. So, uh, yeah. what, what's what's the um, what's the rationale? Uh, what's the rationale to make it copyright free and, and grant it to to you know humanity? I, I do the yeah. same, so I know why I'm doing this, but <laughs> I, I want to know your reasons. So. Um, from, I mean, we have personal reasons as developers because we use open so- source software in a lot of our development work. But uh, EY, of course, is a, a you know we can't operate on public domain all the time. So um, EY has a stance of we contribute open source software, and in this case, I believe it's actually public domain mm-hmm. um, because we believe that in order for our group to be successful, we need to um, encourage Ethereum as a whole to also be successful. And part of that is making sure that we have those zero knowledge proof um, code bases in place for the community. Mm-hmm. So we're hopeful that that our group will grow with the rest of the uh, with the rest of the Ethereum group. Okay, so it's a, uh, and I mean it in a possible, uh, um, like, uh, future, uh, like everyone will consider public chain better than private chain, and you're part of this, I don't know, political movement, in, in the best interpretation of that word. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, that, that makes sense. Thank there's, you. There's a, there's a sort of, there's a sort of uh, uh, um, symmetry between working on public issues of public value and openness, right? And having that, having those two things align at some stage, for sure. Okay. And, and uh, Minister, I think the, the question you asked was also asked by a lot of our colleagues internally as well, because uh, you can imagine we spent quite a lot of effort to develop a protocol such as this and to put it on the public domain for everybody to use without a fee. Obviously, uh, I think we have gone through a lot of internal uh, questions as well. Um, and I guess there's two parts to it as well. Uh, Devon mentioned one part of it that we believe in the ecosystem and if the ecosystem for public blockchain grow, we believe that so will be our business as well. So that's one part of it. Uh, the other part of it that you know sometimes I feel a little bit proud of as well is, is aligned to our vision as well because we believe in building a better working world. Uh, and a lot of what we do with blockchain is about that and uh, we can't see that happening so much on the private blockchain but we do believe that some of these things that we contribute to the public domain will enhance that growth as well so uh you know i i i personally feel a little a little bit proud when uh, when the organization eventually allowed us to uh, open source that uh, mm-hmm. code mm-hmm. as well uh, mm-hmm. obviously we still have a long way to go right but uh, i think that is a small step towards that that mm-hmm. grand vision if you know what i mean yeah, I think it's about trusting um, the ecosystem, trusting not just your peers, but uh, trusting the new generation of technologies will make better use of our design than we ourselves would, uh, which is the, the you know beauty of democracy, right? Uh, I, I think this this is, um, and I, I totally agree, this is why I release everything uh, free of copyright. I just want to make sure that you're internally consistent and coherent about this decision, which sounds you are. So, great. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. Thanks, uh-huh. Minister. I, I have a very a silly question as well. You are obviously very well versed and well, uh, well connected on the blockchain scene and ecosystem. Um, but what's your view of how is uh, Taiwan as a as a whole right, in the in the public sector as well in the private sector in terms of usage of blockchain? Mm-hmm. How how you know how do you think the maturity is as a you know as a country? Well, Taiwan is heavily Ethereum biased. Uh, you probably already know that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, um, frankly speaking, 
um, before Ethereum um, goes to you know full proof of work, the the, the full serenity thing, uh, there's already um, a lot of people developing things in Taiwan uh, that kind of um, leap of faith, I think that's the yeah. English term, <laughs> took a leap of faith uh, that will eventually happen. So whatever the prototype um, is um, aligned with that eventual goal, uh, much like you um, took a leap of faith on the public ecosystem will will finally win out uh, right? as accountability, share infrastructure layer. So uh, I would say we're, we're philosophically aligned. Uh, and then um, from the public sector point of view, uh, there's a lot of uh, uses uh, for um, the the uh, like the second um, copy of accountability, but not as the primary single source of truth. The single source of truth uh, is still uh, guarded using traditional ways, uh, a, a, a VPN, an isolated network, defense in depth, and things like that. And that's because of our cybersecurity situation, uh, we, um, which I don't need to elaborate. Um, and, and so uh, I think the cybersecurity angle uh, always motivates uh, government people to think in terms not of uh, like mathematical proof um, against all attacks. Uh, and and I mean um, I, I saw that in your say private zone transactions you use a rudimentary version of something like homomorphic encryption, uh, which for most mathematicians um, should be good enough. Um, but uh, the Taiwan people would entertain scenarios like the adversary already have a quantum computer of x qubits uh, and things like that uh, that's, that's hidden hidden from our view uh, and and so on. so so we consider threat models that are. Um, Frankly speaking, a little paranoid uh, that that will uh, occur to to other blockchain governance uh, actors, and so because of that, um, analysis uh, through uh, and that part is quite rational actually. So rational analysis, um, the end result is that you see, uh, for example, zkRP uh, used, but the uh, person who did a attestation uh, is still connected to the National um, Insurance Agency's uh, main app, uh, which is powered by this off-public internet um, private in infrastructure, and so on, just because uh, in that case <clears throat> that all hope is lost on the connectivity to the public mainline uh, through whatever attack, we can still recover uh, through the source of truth uh, from this off internet uh, network and so on. So um, th th there's quite a bit of this resilience slash bunker thinking in the Taiwanese public administration. That, and, and that's my, my view anyway. Yeah. Well, great. Yeah, thanks, thanks for sharing. Uh, that's a very valid point as well. And, uh, uh, on a separate note, even a lot of the architecture that we do on public blockchain, uh, the, a lot of the content definitely is not stored on the blockchain itself also. Uh, it's stored off-chain, you know, and that gives an extra layer of security as well. Uh, so only the hash is on the, on the public sure. blockchain, more for traceability mm -hmm. purposes. Yeah. Are, there any, are there any use cases that has uh, already gone into production uh, using public Ethereum? Mm -hmm. Quite a few, actually. Uh, there's the Taiwan Blockchain Alliance that lists uh, those uh, real applications, and the presidential hackathon uh, constantly introduced new ideas that if they win the top five, um, like five uh, first place winners uh, per year, then the president commits uh, to, to make that happen uh, within the next year or so. So it's um, executive power as, um, I guess, per hackathon award. Uh, so coming from the presidential hackathon is, for example, instead of the IC card based uh, national health card, uh, insurance card, um, which requires face-to-face -face, uh, transaction um, with doctors um, in the, uh, like the Lan Yu, uh, a indigenous uh, island, um, people can use the, their phone, uh, even potentially in offline situations, um, to transact just with a camera and TOTP QR code and so on, and to complete a uh, health insurance check-in and so on. And uh, um, people on that island, I think, actually experimented with a local currency, uh, the Dao coin, um, also, uh, which is a classical community currency uh, with um, 
this um, like impactful um, resource distribution so that it's tailored to only make culturally significant transactions uh, for the indigenous people um, and so on. Uh, and the related national uh, health insurance application is, for example, if you're starting a, a marathon, then um, you can say that here are the acceptable ranges of uh, health indicators uh, so that the runners will not suffer um, consequences uh, when they start this marathon. But instead of revealing any of their diagnostic information to you, they can ask the NHI to publish a, a ZKRP um, proof uh, that uh, this person is fit for the marathon or not, uh, without revealing any particular things and, and, and so on. So, but but all these have the same shape. You probably already noticed that it, it doesn't really take away the centralized trust. The the core single source of truth is still somewhere um, somewhere else. Uh, it's not that the blockchain protocol or the governance or the math proof itself somehow um, take some of those uh, trust uh, into a, a zero trust or even just less trust uh, configuration. It's all just to make auditing easier. Um, and, and it's basically um, the, the same thing as, well, I think ecosystem resource planning is actually a pretty good labor for these sort of things. It, it's just to simplify resource planning. It, it's not too radical in other uh, senses. Yeah. No, you, you are you are right. I think I like those examples because I, I feel that while technically it's not not complex, mm -hmm. uh, but operationally it simplifies a lot of things for the agencies. Mm -hmm. They are very practical solutions that results mm -hmm. in uh, a lot of time savings. Just say, for example, validating mm -hmm. a person's records or checking a, a person's records. Uh, and it has, enhances the privacy as well in one aspect, right? That's right. Because in today's terms, uh, it, it, it probably has to be manual, it probably has to have phone calls or exchanges to get it through. I do feel it's a, you know excellent use of the, the technology in very practical ways as well. Um, and, and you are right to point out, uh, in a lot of cases, we are not looking at zero trust, right? We are looking at trusting yeah. something. In this case, it is validating that the record is provided on the blockchain is provided or certified by the right authorities, right? And, and we know that it's correct there. So uh, I, I thought it's a good use case as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the gross, sorry, I was going to say that the gross level of efficiency gain, the reduction of administrative burden on regulated entities and so on, again, back to kind of the, the purpose of this and, and, and the incentives. If you can get those to be aligned and you can get that level of administrative cost way down, that, that, that to me is the, is the first Time is the first benefit. The administrative cost reduction is the second benefit. And sometimes, you know, we're, we're, we're working with governments where those gains are sort of 10% of total program cost. But the biggest impact is when you can connect the financial understanding of what efficiency, sort of the efficient prices, to the effectiveness side. Because then you get to start to change allocated efficiency. And when you're thinking about, you know, literally the trillions of dollars that are spent around the year with public purpose, if we can start to influence the productivity gain at that level, that's where that's where the benefits really start to come. Sure. And to Jimmy's point, if they don't, it do, it doesn't have to be done in a trustless environment. The value is there even in a trusted environment, uh, and I think that's one of the more the more elegant dimensions of it. Certainly, um, I, I do have a, a um, kind of um, um, a gap between what I understand now uh, from your um, open source governance um, state of play, which is most users eventually taking hard forks or at least hard copies uh, of the um, existing state of code toward uh, the kind of um, you know different silos with their own value accounting systems, but just because they use the same underlying NIFO design, somehow um, connecting their instruments of accounting together. I, I'm, I'm not quite, um, I, I mean, I, I understand uh, from, from the kind of principle, like if everyone used the internet, there are ways to write sufficient numbers of adapters that can connect any two systems together, as long as they are all on public internet. I understand around this um, abstract level, um, topological level, uh, but uh, in reality we know if both sides are, are moving parts, 
uh, then this work doesn't get done. Uh, it, it's not likely um, that they will come to governance agreements uh, without some sort of uh, standard making body. And that's only if uh, the incentives align to make such a standard uh, body work. So well, what I'm trying to get at is that even if uh, we do use um, the, the, the NIFO infrastructure for uh, quite a few agencies and so on, but um, because they are probably hard working everything and um, publishing only to their um, known upstreams and downstreams. Uh, what, what's what's your plan, or are there any cases that they there are kind of this spontaneous uh, horizontal connections that can actually serve as the kind of value bridge that uh, Mark described uh, between different data silos? Has this been done? Definitely, and I can take that that question. Um, so I think that that's you know part of the reason why we're encouraging going from uh, private blockchain networks to public blockchain networks. I think it's the same case we make here for being on one, um, in this case one Nightfar, one zero knowledge proof. So mm -hmm. um, I definitely agree. Um, I think that that's that's important to kind of rally rally our local developers and um, basically make sure that we're using one uh, single source of truth when it comes to zero knowledge proofs. That being said, um, you know, part of part of this being in the public domain is allowing uh, competition, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So, um, if there is, um, if as a result a group has decided to make a new and improved version that that the community decides to adopt, then you know, um, we we ideally should be adopting those updates as well. So. Um, we're open to open to ideas and competition and hard forks. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But again, the important part here is for mm -hmm. everyone to align. Yeah, sure. But, but what, what I'm asking is that assuming your open office and liberal office happened, um, what, what, what's your merging back um, track history uh, for this project or some other project? Has, has this happened before? Not yet. Um, <laughs> okay. there, has, there hasn't been a, a, a major competitor just yet. Um, so, so I'm fairly confident that, that our team will be able to at least keep up to date with all of the uh, updated zero knowledge proof requests. Um, but again, if, if, um, if that happens, then, then we'll have to adapt and uh, in essence, if they want to make a PR back to uh -huh. Nightfall uh -huh. with all of their suggestions uh -huh. and updates, then we'll definitely review and merge it back in. Yeah, because they're not legally compelled to. So um, the only thing that compels them to is your goodwill. Uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right. So I'm, I'm just making sure there's a goodwill on a kind of ideology level, and we'll see whether that happens in practice. I have to run to another meeting, but this has been really, really fruitful. I learned a lot. Thank you all for staying up so late uh, for this meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate your time as well. Yeah. Thank you. Live long and prosper. Bye. Bye. Thank you. 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 Th